week, we had the story of Jesus asking the disciples who he was. Peter, speaking for all 12 of them, makes the great statement, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter was very thrilled with himself, and Jesus was proud of Peter. But then Jesus tells him not to tell anyone he was the Messiah, because if they did, they would have taught their own ideas. What would have ensued would have been tragic rebellion and revolution. Before they could teach that Jesus was the Messiah, they had to learn what that meant. The text this week is a continuation of the section which includes verses 21 to 28. Jesus tells the disciples that from now on, he will begin to go to Jerusalem, where the crowds will diminish and those who are left will turn against him. He will be crucified and on the third day be raised from the dead. The disciples don't know what to make of this. Jesus says he must die. That means he will be murdered. The disciples can't bear that message. Peter reacts very much to that information. His reaction proves that the disciples are not ready to teach. The disciples had a very different idea of a Messiah. The Jews had looked forward for 400 years for a Messiah who would be the conquering hero, who would drive out the hated Romans from their land, and then reign as king of Israel. They would finally have freedom and peace. When Jesus started talking about torture and killed in Jerusalem by hanging on a cross, this was so abominable to them that they stopped listening and didn't hear Jesus say, and be raised on the third day. All of this is too much for them to take in. Jesus will not take down Rome, but establish his church. He only has these 12 men to help him do it. There is no plan B. Jesus began to open their eyes to the fact that for him there is no way but the way of, of the cross. He told them that he must suffer at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and scribes. These three groups made up the Sanhedrin, in front of whom Jesus was brought on the night of his trial. The elders were the respected men of the people, the chief priests were the Sadducees, and the scribes were the Pharisees. This Sanhedrin was the highest court in Judaism, and what they said was final. Now when Jesus said this, Peter gets very upset and takes Jesus away from the others. Perhaps he feels the humanness in Jesus and puts his arm around Jesus and says, Forbid it, Lord, this can't be. A suffering Messiah was not possible in Peter's mind, but Jesus rebukes Peter and immediately says such harsh words, Get behind me, Satan. We need to understand something before we can go on with this. We need to understand the tone of voice Jesus used. Of course, we don't know what it was, but most commentators agree that Jesus didn't say it with an angry voice. He said it like a person wounded in the heart with a shudder of horror. Jesus reacted like this because in that moment, there came back to him with cruel force the temptations which he had already faced in the wilderness after his baptism. He had been tempted to take the way of power. Give them bread, give them material things, and they will follow you, Satan said. These thoughts were never far from the mind of Jesus. Again and again, the tempter launches his attack throughout the ministry of Jesus. No one wants a cross, and no one wants to die in agony. In the garden, Jesus was tempted to take another way. Here, in this scripture, Peter is offering that to him now. The sharpness of Jesus' answer is due to the fact that Peter was urging, urging upon Jesus the very things that the tempter was always whispering to him. Peter was confronting Jesus with a way of escape to the cross. 
This is why Peter was Satan. The word Satan means adversary. Satan is any force that tries to deflect us from the way of God. That was why Peter's idea wasn't God, but that of humankind. What made this temptation more acute and severe for Jesus was the fact that it came from one who loved him. Peter speaks as he did because he loved Jesus so much that he couldn't think of Jesus dying in such a horrible way. At the end of the temptations in the wilderness, Jesus says to Satan, and this is my translation, get out of here. But with Peter, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. What Jesus means is, become my follower again. Satan was banished, but Peter is recalled to be Jesus' follower. What Jesus is saying is this, what you said is not the real Peter. You can redeem yourself. Come behind me and be my follower again, and all will be well. Then in verse 24, we have one of the ever-recurring themes of Jesus' teachings. Again and again, Jesus confronted people with the challenge of Christian life. There are three things we must do if we are to live the Christian life. First, we must deny ourselves. To deny oneself means in every moment of life to say no to self and yes to God. The life of self-denial is the life of constant assent to God. Have you ever heard anyone described as self-involved? These are people who are wrapped up in themselves and their own thoughts. They don't give a thought to what other people are experiencing. The truth is, all of us, to one extent or another, are self-involved. But what if we could forget ourselves entirely? What if our thoughts were not focused on our need to achieve, to be happy or important? What if we could keep our minds on the needs of God and His plan for the world? What if we could give up everything we have and are to God and, and His will for our life? Wouldn't that mean that we were becoming a new person? But we like to be in control. Surrendering oneself to God is the first step in a new life. The second step is to take up your cross. The Christian life is a life of sacrificial service. We may have to abandon personal ambition to serve Christ. It may be that the place where we can render the greatest service to Jesus is somewhere where the reward will be small and the prestige non-existent. We would certainly have to sacrifice time, leisure, and pleasure in order to serve God. We may well have to sacrifice some things we could well afford to possess in order to give more away. Some people never want to leave their comfort zone. They never want to do anything that requires sacrifice. Forget about asking them to lead a third grade Sunday school class or doing something simple like inviting a neighbor to church. Oh, Pastor, I couldn't do that. They might be offended. But on the other hand, they may have their entire life completely turned around. You simply cannot serve Christ and always remain in your comfort zone. There are people a short drive from here who face tremendous challenges, loneliness, addiction, or depression. Some of them might be on the verge of taking their own life. Do you care? Over time since the disciples, a host of other people have given up everything to assure that the gospel message has endured. But this is the truth of the situation. If you and I do not pick up the cross of our time, make those hard choices and assume those difficult responsibilities that are required to ensure that the Church of Christ accomplishes its mission, then our children's children will not know the old, old story of Jesus and his love. 
The Christian life is one in which we are always more concerned about others than about ourselves. And the third step is we must follow Christ. This means we are to render to Jesus a perfect obedience. The Christian life, then, is a constant following of Jesus in obedience, in thoughts, in words, and in actions. The Christian walks in the footsteps of Jesus wherever he leads. Now this next part, starting with verse 25, has always worried me. The one who prays for safety loses life. Matthew was writing this gospel during some of the most bitter days of persecution. He is saying that the days may come when you can save your life by abandoning your faith. But if you do, you are really losing your life. So far, we aren't seeing a great persecution here where we live. But if we meet life with a constant search for security, ease, and comfort, we are losing all that makes life worthwhile. I like to put it this way. Whoever tries to save one's life will ruin it. But whoever throws one's life away out of devotion to Christ will actually save it. The day will come when every human will be judged by Jesus. Those who believed in him, served and obeyed him on earth, will be given an eternal heaven. Those who don't will go someplace where they will be away from God forever. Jesus is talking about the person who has won all the world's honors and goods, but just learned that his idolatrous quest for gain has meant disqualification from life with God. What good do these honors and accomplishments do a person then? Are they worth it? The person who ris risks all for Christ finds life. For just one example, many people throughout history have taken risks with their lives so that we now have medicine that will stop many diseases. Throughout our lives, we make decisions. We make ourselves a certain kind of person. We train ourselves to do certain things and not other things. It is possible for a person to gain all the things he or she has set his or her heart on and then realize that he or she has missed the most important thing of all. What are you living for? Self and material things or for the church? Jesus Christ.